Uh, thank you, Talise. Good morning, everyone. My name is Tom Gonzalez. I'm a vegetable crop specialist with uh, Manitoba Agriculture and Resource Development. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to the ninth webinar of this year's 2021 Horticulture School Summer Webinar Series. The team that's providing these webinars includes uh, staff from uh, Manitoba Agriculture, Agriculture Agri-Food Canada, and Assiniboine Community College. Uh, in today's webinar, we're going to have it in the form of question and answer in the sense that if anyone who is on the call has uh, questions related to anything to do with horticulture, if you type them into the uh, Q&A feature on your, uh, on your screen there, we'll see them and endeavor to uh, answer your, your questions for you. I'd like to start today by introducing John Gawlowski. He's a uh, Manitoba Agriculture's entomologist, and he'll be presenting on beneficial insects this morning. So here's John. John is here. <laughs> so we have the presentation. Yeah, I'll just go. Uh, yeah, it should be right in here. There we go. There we go. Okay, so, awesome. Yes. Okay, so what we're going to be doing today is a beneficial insect quiz. And I know some beneficials are very um, well known, others maybe less so, and even some of the different stages of some of the ones we think we know um, may not be obvious to everybody. So what we're going to do today is have a beneficial insect quiz, uh, go over some of the, the uh, insects, and I've got seven different insects picked out, and we'll see how many you know. And just uh, to begin with, uh, one thing that I can't stress enough is that on any farm or garden, having no insects is really not a good thing because insects do provide a lot of beneficial and essential services, uh, aside from pollination. Pollination is the big obvious one that everyone knows about. But aside from that, decomposition, uh, soil structure, um, some eat weed seeds, some eat other insects. There's actually many ways insects are good to have around. Problem is you don't want too many of the bad guys, but you do want a lot of some of these good guys. So the first of our seven insects is this one here. So have a look at this. Take a few seconds to have a good look and see if you think you know what this one is. And we'll look at the answer here. This is a lady beetle larva. So most most people, everyone probably knows what a lady beetle looks like. Lady beetle, ladybug, it's the same thing. Uh, they're synonyms. But uh, there's actually lots of different types of lady beetles. There's 65 different species in Manitoba and over 160 species in Canada, very diverse group. And of course, the adults, uh, which is in the bottom right corner, uh, everyone knows what they look like, usually orange, red, sometimes yellowish spots on the back, depends on the species. The larva, which is in the upper left corner, uh, they're very much, I'll say, alligator shaped. They look like little mini alligators, usually grayish or black in color, often with some orange tufts, uh, varies with the species a little bit. But the, the more common ones are generally black, alligator shaped with orangey tufts. Also in the middle here is a pupa. And that's good to know too. I had a call one time from somebody who said they had Colorado potato beetle larva all over their dill. And I thought, no, uh. that can't be. <laughs> they do not feed on dill, but they were adamant. Yes, there's lots of them. They're in my dill. So I went and had a look. It was lady beetle pupae that were all over the dill. So they had aphids in there earlier and the lady beetles were in there eating the aphids. So. Yeah. Don't mistake them. Now, some species of lady beetles have really big appetites, and there's been some good research on this. Um, one of the studies that I'm citing here looked at, um, which is probably our most common species here, the seven-spotted lady beetle, 
um, they were able to, the females were able to eat over 100 soybean aphids in 24 hours. The males a little bit less, 78, and their later juvenile stage is over 100. It's typical for the females to eat a bit more than the males. They've got reproductive needs, so that's common when they do these studies. And the multicolored Asian lady beetle, which is a newer one, that one that's good at getting into your homes, um, that one can also has a big appetite. And they can eat, depending again on the stage, um, anywhere from 50 to over 100 aphids per individual per day. So big appetites, when you have lots of them, it can make a difference in your aphid populations. And don't those Asian ones tend to uh, bite mammals? Um, the Asian ones, I'll say yes, they can bite. There's actually two species that can give you a little bit of a nip. And they're not after blood. Right. Um, but they they like the salt on your skin, so um, sometimes they'll land on you, and it seems like they're biting you unprovoked. But what they're again, if you're especially if you're outside and you're sweating, you got right. a little bit of uh, salt on the skin, they like that. So yeah, uh, I've had them land on me and just bite for what seems no reason before too. <laughs> like, why'd you do that? But yeah, they're just after insect Gatorade essentially so and they're one of the uh, the species that are good at, get, good at getting into homes um, where they're native to they overwinter in cracks and crevices and cliffs in the prairies the closest thing to that is your house so they're yeah. good at getting in yeah they like going under vinyl siding uh, and yes. uh, stuff like that yeah exactly so we'll move on to our second quiz question now here's another alligator shaped one but it's definitely not black and it doesn't have the orange tufts. So the question is, what is this? And these things are really quick. You'll see them running around, love to feed on aphids if they get into the colonies, but you also see them feeding on caterpillars and other things in the crops as well. So this is a lacewing larva. So uh, once again, people probably know the adult stage more than they do the larva. So the adults are these fairly large green insects with the lacy wings, hence lace wing. Um, some, they were very common this year. Uh, some of the vegetable crops, I know they had lots in the fields. Um, some of the field crops, uh, a quinoa field that I went into, I couldn't believe the number of lace wing adults I was seeing. Now, they were probably drawn in there because there was aphids earlier. Right. Um, although they don't just eat aphids. In the picture, in this picture, what it's actually got in its big sickle-like mandibles is a ligus bug nymph. Ligus bug nymphs are quick. So are lacewing larvae. Uh, yeah, not too many things can run down and track a, uh, a ligus nymph. So they are quick. They will... They're opportunistic predators. Whatever is there and um, small enough and slow enough for them to catch, they will go after it, catch it, eat it, including their own siblings. Uh, so one of the things you might note, here's the eggs of lace wings. They're laid on big, long stalks. And one of the hypotheses on why they do this is they will eat their siblings and possibly having the eggs on stalks prevents the hatched ones from eating all the other eggs and their siblings. Mm. So if that's one of the potential reasons. If you see eggs like this on big stalks, they're lacewing eggs. So that's another sign that you've got lacewings running around. And again, very, very uh, um, good predators, love aphids, love, um, well, they eat thrips and mites and small caterpillars like diamondback moth, they would enjoy eating those. Okay, the third question here. Now, this one looks a little different. There's no legs on it. It looks almost slug-like. The tapered end at the, the top here, that's the front. That's the mouth parts. Um, there's a little hook that they impale things like aphids with, and they hold them up and suck the juice out. So there's a hint of some aphid predator. I'll give you one more hint on this one. The adults are actually flies that are good at hovering. So that might be a bit of a hint that helps you out. So if you haven't figured it out yet, this is hoverfly larva. So once again, people probably know the adults of these things. Hopefully by now you do, you don't think they're bees. 
but the adults are very good bee and wasp mimics, but they're very good at hovering almost like a helicopter, extremely common. Uh, you'll see them around almost anything flowering, but if, particularly if you have um, things with small flowers, carrots, dill, things like that, sometimes they're just humming with the, the hoverfly larva. They're all over the, the flowers. So they, they, as adults, they like to feed on the pollen and nectar. But when it comes to laying eggs, they're really good at smelling and detecting where there's aphid honeydew. Uh, aphid honeydew gives off a certain scent. So aphids, when they feed, they eat a lot of sap and they uh, secrete what we call honeydew, this sugary solution that comes out their back end and it gets on the leaves and on the plants. The hoverflies are good at figuring out where this stuff is and where there's honeydew, there's aphids. That's where they go and they lay their eggs because their larvae are actually blind legless maggots. But if they're, the eggs are laid right in an aphid colony, they don't really have to move too far. What they do is they kind of tap around with this front end. They're, when you watch them on the plants, they're tapping around. And once they detect an aphid, then they sort of impale it with their front end with that uh, hook for a mouth part, hold it up in the air, suck the juice out of it, and then put it down and grab another one. And that's how they feed. Um, they will feed on other things other than aphids, but usually very small insects. So your thrips and mites, if they were to encounter them. But aphids are the main thing. And there's a few species that will feed on um, things other than other insects. There's a few of them, such as a rat-tailed maggot that feed on more decomposing material. But they're exceptions. Most are predators, so good things to have around. And very diverse group over 500 different types of hoverflies in Canada. Okay, enough of the flies. Now we'll do some true bugs. So the first one, again, type of true bug, very small, quite minute. It has what almost looks like a skull and crossbone pattern on the wings, something like you'd see on a pirate flag. So put the clues together here, uh, minute, pirate-like markings, and a true bug. So if I haven't given you enough clues, this is your minute pirate bug. So uh, minute, definitely just a few millimeters long, um, quite small. So you have to have good eyes to really appreciate this patterning on the back. Uh, very good predators. Uh, once again, smaller insects. Um, so I've got a list that I will pull up. Here we go. So they will feed on things like aphids, mites, thrips, scale insects, even really small caterpillars. What is very opportunistic for them is they will feed on nectar and pollen when prey is scarce. So they're often one of the um, better early season predators on some of the aphids and mites. So in study on soybeans and soybean aphid, they found that early in the season, pirate bugs were one of the dominant and best predators. Later on, the lady beetles, the lace wings, the hoverflies really kick in and and can help stay, start taking down those populations. But early on, um, the pirate bugs are often the ones um, first at the, the buffet because, again, they've got other things they can feed on other than just prey. They will feed on the pollen and nectar if, it's, if the crop is flowering uh, to sustain them until the prey get abundant enough. Now, the other thing to note about my new pirate bugs, if you're somebody who uh, is into greenhouse operations, you can purchase these. Uh, they're usually sold by their scientific name, Aureus, O-R-I-U-S. Um, people release them in greenhouses for aphid, mite, and thrip control, and uh, they can be quite effective. They've been used for decades for that purpose. So Would there be any issue, you said they can feed on nectar and pollen, would they be uh, re reducing pollination at all? Uh... No, if anything, they'd be helping pollination yeah. because they're moving around in the plants, getting right. pollen on their um, their legs and moving it. Um, same thing that bees and right. hoverflies and other insects would be doing. So fair enough, they are removing some of the pollen, but the plants produce so much Way pollen. More than they need. Yeah. Exactly, and, and that's, that's uh, why even honeybees, bumblebees, for the bit of pollen they remove, there's a lot more that's going to be produced. Right. So so short answer is no, they're not going to reduce pollination. If anything, they're going to help increase yeah. pollination. So good to have these guys running around in your crops. Good question. 
Okay, the next one is another true bug. So it's got bug in the name as well. Now this one's a little bit more fragile and delicate looking. So in the name somewhat reflects that. So I'll give this one away. This is called a damsel bug. So probably not the uh, most, I'll say aggressive sounding name for a, a good predator, damsel bug but they are really good predators. If you look carefully at this one here, you can see what looks like a long beak on it. And this is for puncturing other insects and secondary two cell, that's what they do. Um, they feed on, once again, smaller insects, aphids, small caterpillar, diamondback moth, they love diamondback moth larva, um, insect eggs, but, and they're also quick. So ligus bugs and leaf hoppers are also on their menu, both of which are quite quick insects. So they can help take their populations down. They have what I refer to as a strike and kill, almost like a rattlesnake type of um, um, feeding system. A rattlesnake, if it wants to feed on a mouse, it strikes it, injects venom, lets it die, then ingests it. Uh, Dames of bugs will do the same thing. They've got a venom. Um, don't worry, if they, if they bite you, it's not going to harm you. It won't harm a human but it will harm an aphid or a diamondback moth larva. So they inject their venom, let the thing stop squirming around, then suck the juice out. What is maybe a good thing is sometimes they will run around and inject their venom into several pieces of prey, feed on a couple and then move along. So sometimes they don't actually feed and completely suck the juice out of all the things they kill. And in one study with diamondback moth, uh, let's see if I get my numbers right here, but they were dropping diamondback moths into uh, a container with a hungry damsel bug that hadn't been fed in a while, seeing how many it would kill and consume. Now it killed, I believe it was over 90 of the mm -hmm. caterpillars in a 24 hour period. Now whether it sucked all the juice out of them, it's hard to know, but it did kill quite a few of them. So they can be really good predators. Okay, moving on to some more beetles here. I'm gonna end with a couple beetle questions. And I wanted to get these two in because the next two beetles, the next two groups of beetles are extremely common. So it's good to know what these things do. Now my clue for this one, aside from being quite diverse, these things like to run around on the ground. Some will climb plants, a lot of species, you will find them mainly on the ground. They're nocturnal predators. If you turn over a board or a log or, or a rock or something during the day, you often see these brown or black beetles scurry away along the ground. These are called ground beetles. Some people might know them by their um, scientific name, carabid beetles. Uh, but ground beetles is a common name, extremely diverse group. We got about um, almost 400 species in the prairies. And in Canada, there's a 983 species wow of ground beetles. So there's roughly twice as many species of ground beetles as there are birds in Canada. Hmm. So hugely diverse. Uh, the one you see here is, is actually one of the ones that will climb plants a little bit. This is a Calisoma ground beetle and they sometimes will climb plants to feed on different things. Love caterpillars. Um, that's one of their favorite foods. They make a good meal but they will, some species will move around in the ground even and feed on things like root maggot eggs and larva. Uh, they will feed on slugs. And there's some species that in addition to prey will also feed on weed seeds. And there's a few studies going on now looking at just how beneficial these weed seed predators are. So they've got uh, multiple uh, ways that they can be beneficial. Um, we have, actually the one in the photo here, uh, was is a beetle ground beetle that was captured by one of our summer students a couple of years ago. We kept it as a lab pet for a while. We named it Peter. So this was Peter, Peter the Calisoma ground beetle. Um, and the student was bringing in caterpillars and grubs from her farm daily to feed it. Uh, she was have, having trouble keeping up with Peter. He was eating easily eight or nine mm. different caterpillars or grubs per day. So big appetite. So uh, that helps out if, it's, if they're feeding on cutworms or something and they're each eating uh, eight or nine, certainly a good thing. So the final one in the quiz is another beetle. 
Although this one people often don't recognize as a beetle. These little two brown pad-like things here, those are the forewings, so the, the first pair of wings. You've got a second pair of wings that are kind of more delicate looking, they're tucked underneath. The wings are short, and most of what you see here is exposed abdomen. So to a lot of people, this barely looks like a beetle. And you know, I've seen people that have found these and asked, what kind of fly or wasp is this? But it's actually a beetle, just really, really short wings. And when they get disturbed or run around, they often will stick their abdomen up in the air. And they are called rove beetles, or some people will call them staff beetles because of the way they hold their abdomen up. Rove beetles, though, is really their a proper common name. Hugely diverse group, hugely diverse. Over 1,700 species in Canada. And I would say probably one of the most underappreciated groups of predators out there. Again, they're extremely diverse. Uh, if you start digging around in any garden or any field, eventually you're going to find rove beetles. They're very common, but they're not seen a lot because often they are in the soil and they spend a lot of time in the soil. So they get really uh, unseen and underappreciated and they're fairly small too. So easy not to really be taking note of them. They do like to feed on small insects, often insects in the soil. Uh, they have been studied for their predaceous abilities on root maggots. They are known to be very good predators of root maggot eggs, larva, and pupa. Uh, there was a study at the University of Manitoba looking at whether or not we can bring in some um, little beetles from Europe to potentially augment the ones we have here for root maggot control. Because root maggots, they're a really, really tough insect to deal with. Um, they're in the soil on the roots of things like your turnips and your radishes. And yeah. um, now this study was looking at canola, but cruciferous plants yeah. in particular, they can be a real issue on. Then you've got other related species like your onion maggot and seacorn maggot. These things are hard to manage. Insecticides often are hard to use or don't work well. So there has been work looking at potential for augmenting the uh, rove beetle populations uh, to maybe help with this a little bit. But regardless, our native populations, they certainly do help out. Unfortunately, you still do have root maggot issues that develop, but one of the key natural enemies of root maggots are these rove beetles. So. We will end with that, and I don't know if there's any questions that people have, but if well, I will just can... have a look in the Q&A and see what we got here. Uh, questions. I'm not seeing any questions right now. We can come back to those. If anyone has any questions, feel free to type them into the, uh, the question feature there. Thanks, John. Uh, I got a couple of emails over the last few weeks that were basically just asking me questions like, you know, what's going on in other areas of the province? You know, I guess if someone was from, say, Portage, they might be wondering what's going on uh, east of the Red River or, or whatever. So I, I thought I'd just make a few observations here before we uh, shut the webinar down for the day. Um, the lack of a killing frost is certainly uh, quite widespread. There's, uh, other than quite a ways up north, there's been no reported uh, killing frosts that uh, have affected vegetable crops that, that I'm aware of. Even the, the summer crops, you know, that are very uh, non-tolerant to frost, uh, tomatoes, uh, peppers, those kind of things. Um, also, I, I got a few questions, and Vikram, our pathologist, is uh, indisposed today with a potato harvest, but uh, they were asking about, uh, I think I have a picture of, uh, let's see here. So, yeah, I'll get to that one in a sec. The idea of curing uh, with these, uh, high temperatures that we've had are relatively high when you consider what normal is. Um, curing, field curing some of the crops, like this happens to be a picture of one of our onion trials at Portage. And 
Yeah, we had no, some years we have quite a bit of uh, trouble drying them down in the field and actually have to move them indoors when the, uh, the frost or the rain come in uh, September. But here you can see on the left side, there's a bit of green in one onion, but basically uh, everything's dried out fairly well considering they, they were only laying on the ground when this picture was taken for eight days. Um, so basically, uh, all over, we've had better, uh, be better curing of, uh, of crops compared to, uh, compared to a normal year. Um, calls have, uh, come in about powdery mildew. This picture is, uh, of a, of a gourd. I'm not exactly sure what, uh, what type of gourd, but it's early on in the year and well not that early it's in august but it's certainly not in late september and you can see on the uh on the leaf in the very upper left corner it's uh quite green and uh lush whereas the the leaf on its immediate uh, right hand side and the leaf immediate be immediately below it are starting to show some uh powdery mildew symptoms and if we were in that field Today, with no frost, I'd certainly be betting that the majority of leaves in that field would be a dusty white kind of color. Um, this time of year, where uh, when we're seeing it, uh, powdery mildew, I mean, there, there's really no, no concern, no reason to be wanting to control it at this time. If it was earlier on and uh, threatening uh, bulking and maturity of uh, wh whatever vine crop we were uh, we found it in, then that's a possibility of wanting to control it. But at this time of year, even though it's potentially running wild in, uh, in a lot of vine crops, I, I wouldn't be concerned about uh, trying to deal with it this time of year. Um, one of the... Uh, one of the other things that's come up is questions regarding uh, harvesting in the heat. Now, obviously, a, a lot of uh, vegetable crops require uh, cooling uh, right away, no matter what the, the, the state of the, the weather may be, uh, especially if, if you're cutting a crop, uh, like if you're harvesting cauliflowers or, or whatever, I, I mean, you're not going to leave them sitting out in the, in the sun for days. You know, you're going to get them into uh, refrigeration and, and cool them down. But this time of year where root crops are coming in, uh, carrots, uh, potatoes, that kind of thing. Uh, when we had, what was it, two days ago, we had 30 degree weather. Uh, I mean, I'd be, uh, I'd be shy about wanting to, to bring a, a crop in of potatoes or carrots, uh, and try to store them with that much heat in them. Uh, if I had, to, if, if I was behind harvest or something and I had to harvest, uh, look at harvesting evenings, uh, early mornings, that kind of thing versus the heat of the day and trying to, uh, to cool them off uh, as quickly as possible. Uh, in the case where you got 30 degree days, moving outside air in isn't gonna be enough. You'd need some form of uh, refrigeration or cooling uh, to do that. You could certainly run fans uh, to cool them off once the, the nighttime temperatures, or the temperatures dropped at nighttime, but uh, I, I, it wouldn't be enough to during the day be bringing in 30 degree air, you'd just be making the problem worse. So when we do run into days that are extremely hot, I'd consider uh, modifying a, a harvest schedule or just not harvesting at all kind of thing, depending on what your, uh, your needs are. And uh, those are just a few comments. Uh, I'm just gonna double check, see if anyone has any questions, feel free to type them in. Uh, I'm not seeing any. I'd uh, like to thank everyone who uh, attended today. Uh, we value uh, your feedback and certainly uh, feel free to uh, email, uh, call, 
however you'd like to with comments, uh, issues, uh, things you'd like to see us cover. Uh, yeah, and uh, this is the second last uh, webinar in the series. The last one will be two weeks today on the 15th of October. I uh, hope you can attend that and have a great rest of your day. Thank you very much for attending. Bye.